Equality for white people. If that triggered you in any way, you're an anti-white racist. Minorities have affirmative action, diversity quotas, special months of the year. White people have is getting called racist by militant leftists. This is the truth. We all know this is the truth, but some of y'all choose to pretend as though minorities are under attack in America and everyone's against minorities and da 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 da. I'm a minority, but I don't have a minority mindset. I don't need special privileges. I don't need affirmative action and I don't need diversity quotas. We all know that modern day white people are actually the oppressed ones. Everyone else is getting celebrated and told Christian Walker you are you know what I think we're gonna have to talk face to face So Christian, I uh, hold on, let me drag Mitch away. All right. So Christian, I okay. So I, I'm 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 scrolling through TikTok, right? Uh -huh. And I actually didn't see your videos. What I was seeing was people responding to your video because I'm on liberal TikTok. Right. And but what you don't realize is you're. I mean, you probably realize better than I do. You're also you're. Uh, I'm also on liberal TikTok. You're one of the main thing. You and the lady who s says that masks don't work. You know the lady who who covers the mask and a towel and goes, this is a sneeze. Oh, I haven't seen her. Well, she's also was big on liberal TikTok for a while. She made a TikTok like, please, TikTok, please get me off liberal TikTok. Um, and would you consider yourself um, right? Like a, right a conservative? Right? Yeah. Um, I would consider myself conservative. I'm definitely not on the left. Um, so. I mean, it's so interesting because you and I, okay, I am comically left. I mean, I'm I'm left of Bernie Sanders. Oh, I mean, God. yeah. I mean, I don't I, I don't even wear deodorant half the time. Like that's how left I am. You know what I mean? Um, I acknowledge uh, genders beyond um, man and woman. Um, or, or I I my leftism is probably you might consider it extreme. Radical. Yeah, you might consider it radical. And you probably consider me to be a bit radical. Um, oh yeah, you're. You, you, th there are points where I can't tell if and my my so <laughs> if I'm full, disclosure, full disclosure. Me and Christian had a talk off camera like two weeks ago, maybe right before I moved. Um, and my goal is to keep this uh, more or less pretty chill, but also I want you to maintain your opinions and and keep. But but also, I, what what are you going to do if on this call I convince you? that America has a problem with systemic racism? Um, I mean, I've done all my research, Bob, but I would congratulate you for doing that. But I, I just, you know, I don't see that happening. Love you to death. We had a great chat two weeks ago. I don't foresee that happening, but I'm excited to hear about your opinions. I'm excited to bring mine. So do you, so you don't think that America has a problem? Uh, you don't think that America has a problem with systemic racism? Oh, absolutely not. And I would define systemic racism as laws. Yes, and, well, I, mean, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Whenever me and my friends argue, I always say we have to make sure we're talking about the same thing before we can agree whether or not this is a thing. So I would say systemic racism uh, is laws in place now or laws that have been in place in the past that are still having a trickle-down effect affecting certain races and no reparations have been made to fix those laws. Um... Sure, we can define it as that. I'd more define it as there's laws put in place right now that hold certain people back in society. We live in well, a systemically I racist country. I mean, of course, there's we have a history of, of certain things, but how big of an effect that has now um, is probably where we differ. Well, like, for example, I, I'm going to uh, pull up some of the things that you said. By the way, have, have you, I, I know I said I was going to send you some links, but I did not send you any. Life got crazy. Um, also, to be fair, I am super easy to look. I mean, I'm all over the internet. I, I'm i on TikTok. I'm on, I mean, I don't, I don't, maybe I don't have as many TikTok followers as you do. I don't know. How many do you have? You probably have more than me. I don't fucking know. I'm looking right now. Christian Walker has 312,000. That is a lot of TikTok followers. And I get more views than I have followers. 
Um, well, I mean, that's because so many people are watching you from such extreme, you know, you have people watching you from both ends of the spectrum, um, of the political spectrum. And then also I have all the, you, so I'm, I'm, I am, to be fair, I am easy to find. Were, were you able to look anything? Because you didn't know who I was before I, I reached out to you. I looked some of you up and then I, wa or then I told one of my friends that watches Drag Race, because you said you're on Drag Race, um, that I was going on your show and make America purse first again. <laughs> <You're so disappointed. laughs> so the thing here's the thing about you christian you are i think that you have some genuinely charming qualities you are um for the most part uh, uh relatively articulate you are very <laughs> good well i think you are articulate i think sometimes some of the things you say are not necessarily true um uh, and you are good looking. You are, you have so many qualities that I just love. You're athletic. I fun you're, on a little chat two weeks ago. We were BFFs. You're a hard worker. Um, I mean, I see that you, you say you're going to school for uh, business. Chinese, French, and international development, triple major. But it, it, but it seems like you're trying to uh, gear yourself more toward um, political commentary. I mean, it, I kind of just fell into it. That was never the plan um, until the BLM terrorist attacks. But until then, it wasn't. Yeah, so, I didn't plan on going that way. So that's one. Of the, so that's one thing I want to talk about. So in, in one of your videos, I've watched all your videos. Luckily, you only have like five YouTube videos, so I didn't have to spend like weeks and weeks looking at them. But I have seen them all. Um, and I was gonna, I was gonna start off with your coffee drinks that you always have, like your hold the hold the black supremacy, uh, and um, I'll see you have white one. mocha hold the BLM. But here's the question: so you say that um, you say that Proud Boys is not a white supremacist group. No way. But you say that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist group. Totally. But. In the same regard, they they are and they aren't. For example, why, uh, Proud Boys, they're not listed as a terrorist group. They're not listed as a white supremacy group. And in the registry of terrorist groups, Black Lives Matter is actually indeed not a terrorist group. Uh, now, whether or not you yeah. think it's they're terrorizing. What I see it as, you know, I know mm -hmm. it's not legally listed as that, but, you know, if the shoe fits. So what makes you think that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization? Well, should we start with Proud Boys or you want to start with BLM? We can, we can start with Black Lives Matter, then we can go into Proud Boys. Okay, I think Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization simply because of their actions and the amount of violence they've caused around the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we can go into certain things as, you know, I don't think that BLM has done much to help the black community. I don't think mm -hmm. burning down minority-owned businesses is helping the black community out. Burning down, um, there's a... There was a Korean a Korean owned liquor store on my street in LA when the BLM terrorist attacks came to my neighborhood that was completely looted and burned down. I didn't think that helped minorities. I didn't think them looting, you know, black owned gas stations helped minorities at all. And it's more of it's the crazy amount of violence in every American city that happened over the summer added in with um, the defense of black criminals. You know, it's not like we're defending. Ben Carson, who gets wrongly killed by a cop, <laughs> or, do you think, or do you me, think that uh, do you think that black criminals deserve to be killed by cops? I don't think any, I don't think anyone deserves to be killed des deserves to be killed. But if you make certain choices, then expect to face consequences. So, but the question is, so my point is, like a lot of people's point is, even if you are a criminal. You right. still don't deserve to be. So just because you are a criminal does not mean that you don't deserve a, a, a fair justice. A death sentence. And I totally get that. And I mean, in a perfect world, um, someone who was charging cops with a knife, there was a, a gentleman yesterday who got shot in Philadelphia. I'm sure you mm -hmm. saw that. I was right on in Philadelphia. In the perfect world, we could, you know, cops could use their magical powers and put a force field around him and then transport him to the jail and we could have a perfect, we could go through court trials. But if you're charging at me with a knife, if you're putting me in a violent situation, expect to get shot. And I'm assuming, are you a, are, are you, um, a gun toting um, queen? I'm very, <laughs> I'm very pro 2A. 
Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what's so funny, and I was talking to one of my friends about this on Saturday, pre-BLM terrorism, I was getting work down. And I'm sure, I mean, you know, from my videos, I'm very um, firm and where I stand on things politically, but I was getting broken down on gun control. And I was like, well, maybe we could do this and this. After BLM, oh, I don't want any regulations, no rules. I want no my regulations. Gun. I'm going to take it. No, no, I just want my gun. Period. And you and you genuinely believe in no now. So I'm intrigued by that because you know the Black Lives Matter movement does not have it has practically zero gun violence. There are practically zero incidences of Black Lives Matter uh, inciting gun violence from protesters. Right. Like, right. So why, so why does Black Lives Matter make you want a gun even more? Oh, because if a BLM terrorist is coming into my home, they're getting shot. They're breaking into my home. Definitely. There's also not a, there's also not a, um, there's also practically no evidence of Black Lives Matter uh, protesters breaking into people's homes either. So like, where, where is this narrative where Black Lives Matter protesters are, are now breaking into people's homes? Oh, it's not even necessarily homes. It's also business. I don't happen to own a business right now or like an actual store, um, mm -hmm. but it's it would be defense of my store. It's more the concept. It'd be defense of my Got store. It. We know um, the couple in St. Louis when they broke onto their property, and I know there's all these different viewpoints on how that went down, but just in case, next round of BLM, whatever, BLM comes into my neighborhood. If they make it through my big walls, my guard gate, my all of this, they're getting shot. What neighborhood do you live in in, in L.A.? I live in um, West Hollywood. In L.A., I'm in Beverly Hills, West Hollywood. Beverly Hills, and I live in West Hollywood. Work. So I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued by, I, I want to talk about some of the things that you've said, because I want to try to break it down. White supremacy is a made-up concept, made up on college campuses to create demented leftist liberals. Praise God. So you think that um, white supremacy was made up on college campuses and isn't a real thing? Okay, not was made up on campuses, but is made up on college campuses modern day. I think white supremacy was a thing, you know, during slavery, during Jim Crow, of course, I'm not insane. But today, I don't see white supremacy being an issue anywhere. I don't, you know, I just, I'm, the media talks about white supremacy so often. I'm dying for a white supremacist to come out and show his true colors. I'm, I'm just dying to see one. I've never seen one. I've seen lots of BLM terrorism. I've seen lots of violence from BLM in our neighborhood of West Hollywood, in Hollywood, in LA, in Atlanta, in DC, in Portland, everywhere. I'm just, I, I'm dying to see a white supremacist. But do you also see how when you keep calling them Black Lives Matter terrorists and they're not actually listed as a terrorist organization, what you're actually doing is spreading lies. So it's not actually an opinion. For example, whether or not something someone is a terrorist is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. And you keep saying they're terrorists, but it's just not true. What you're saying is categorically false. Well, would false. Ryder be better? I call them terrorists because I define terrorists as someone who spreads an absurd amount of violence so it's a he they are terrorists to me but we I mean, also don't get to make up our own definition of word but we don't get to make up our own definition of words so you can't go well my definition of terrorist you have to use the definition of terrorist i know but it seems it seems as as though we do get to do that because all the media does is call them blm protesters and protesters don't burn buildings down you don't have to sneak around. <laughs> my, my partner is, is leaving. Um, well, there's also probably a part of why they call them protesters is because statistics have also shown, um, and it's not the National Bureau of Statistics, but less than 7% of Black Lives Matter protesters actually are violent. Yeah. I, like, I, less I, I, than think that's, I think that's insane. I mean, well, I don't know where that is. Have you protest before? Sorry? Have you ever been at a protest before? A well, they were, right, they were right off my street. Now, this was like, I mean, I would never go to one now because I just, my fate, whatever. But pre-me talking politics, when they were right on my road, when they were coming in to destroy my town, destroy Melrose, you're familiar with Melrose, um, me and my friend just walked down and we were there for like probably 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, so I have. And did you, did you find that a lot of them were violent because I've been I've been at a lot of Black Lives Matter protests and I've I have um, I've seen 
where they turn about. I've even had friends get arrested. But usually what will happen is someone will do something to incite a crowd, which is actually pretty easy to do when you're in a crowd that has such high um, energy. Like the energy is so high and it's really uh, charged and people are very emotional. And then one person can do something to aggress police officers or the police officers will do something to aggress a person and then everything goes crazy. But in actuality, they're not all violent. Oh, I get that. Um, and, and my so, you're, you're, so you're putting this really small, I mean, really small contingency of the Black Lives Matter protesters and you're categorizing all Black Lives Matter protesters as terrorists. Also. I don't think I am at all. Every Basically, every big city was on fire over the summer. So, you know, if, if that's only 7% and it was every it was Atlanta, Dallas, LA, uh, Portland, DC, New York, uh, just so many different... Chicago, everywhere, every, if, if that's only 7%, then crap. I mean, I, I still- Well, here's the thing. I lived in New York City during, were you in Texas during all this? Were you in, were you in actually in LA? I was in LA. Work. And- so I was in New York during all this. I don't know that I would categorize New York City as being on fire. In fact, uh, Megan McCain famously said, my neighborhood is a, is a, is a, like a, I, she used some word yeah, that was pretty extreme. And that lady who lived in her building. And she was like, I live in the same building. You just made, like, it was like, look at, hey, everyone, look, I'm outside. It's not a war zone. It's literally, I'm like outside waiting for my Uber. And I remember going to the airport. I remember going to my, uh, how was it? The stores, the Fifth Avenue, all the stores broken into, it's still boarded up. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. it was madness. In Brooklyn, it was, it was crazy. So, so I just don't, like, I don't get that. But also, do you see how, like, for example, let's say everyone's marching down the street, thousands of people are marching down the street. It only takes, like, 7 to 14 people to incite madness, and then it looks like everyone's actually engaging in it when that's not the truth. A lot of people are trying to get out of the madness and go home, but because it's moving really fast, it looks like everyone is destroying the street. So it looks like all these crazy black people are fucking things up on the street. Statistically speaking... Black people cannot commit more crime than white people unless there's some truly insane, like, for example, if if literally every single black person, including the two of you and me, if every single black person in America, if we were all engaged in crime, violent crime, and only half of white people were engaged in violent crime, we would still be doing about a quarter of the crime they'd be doing. But the fact that there are more black, and and we all know that's just not what happens. We know from science and from statistics that black people do not commit more crime than white people, is that black people are- We shouldn't even even get close to committing. We're 13% of the population, they're over 60. So for us to even get close, like in the murder rate where we actually commit more murder than every other race combined, that's insane. So but that- also, I think you're not looking at other other things. For example, the fact that black people are persecuted of violent crimes more than white people are is because black neighborhoods are policed more heavily than white neighborhoods are. Therefore, we have a higher incarceration rate also because of different uh, different uh, crime bills and different laws that have been uh, placed on our society that makes it seem like we're actually committing more crimes. So we're actually not committing more crimes than white people. Well, just one more thing on the protest and then we'll come right back to there is, I never, and I don't I don't know if you said this, I don't think you did, I just wanna make clear, I never said that all of the BLM protesters or rioters were black. And I know they weren't. I mean, I know there were tons of white people there. There were tons of Hispanic. I know there were tons of violent white people at the BLM protest. So I don't think the BLM rights were all because of black people. I know that not to be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. Um, back to, so now we're talking police, policing black neighborhoods. Um, you know, if, if that's the case, if, if, if over policing is the only reason why black people are prosecuted more then I mean, I, I would have to understand then why do famous black athletes not, not live in their hometowns when they make it out of their poor black neighborhood? Like the, so I'll, I'll respond to that. 
it's not the only reason. There's a lot of reasons why black neighborhood, why black people are, are incarcerated at a higher rate than white people. So the couple of things, one, and there's implicit bias. Uh, I personally believe that the police demographic mm-hmm. patrolling a neighborhood should reflect the demographic of the neighborhood they're policing. Some of the so lowest like incarceration, say again? So like segregation? No, not segregation. That's not, that's not the same thing. It's actually more like affirmative action. The segregation. What it's saying is, for example, if you look at like in Jewish neighborhoods in New York City, they have some of the lowest incarceration rates because there are neighborhoods in New York City where the police are because of their religion and because uh, when you're Hasidic, there's a lot of rules regarding like men touching women, women touching men, that unless you're like Hasidic yourself, you wouldn't know all the rules. So yeah. their cops are Hasidic, their teachers are Hasidic, everything. So they have really, really low incarceration rates in those areas with Hasidic police officers. Um, And I believe that a big part of that is because they aren't influenced by implicit bias in a negative way when it comes to policing their own neighborhoods. So that's like one concept that I have in terms of that. So it's not, that that does not make it segregation. That just makes it, um, in my opinion, it's more like affirmative action, which as you probably know, because you do a lot of research, there's this notion out there in the world that affirmative action is like this thing that helps like black people get their job. It actually affects them, yeah. Well, and white women are actually probably the highest recipient, not probably, are categorically the highest recipient of jobs because of affirmative action. Oh, I don't doubt that. Um, but anyway, so-, so We that's have the- diversity quotas. We have a lot more than just affirmative action for- people of color, but. but... But also a big reason why people do that, for example, we, we were talking earlier, like, if I break your leg, it's not just enough for me to say sorry. So if you have policies, things like slavery, things like Jim Crow, um, things like forced segregation, literal ghettos, where black people are forced to live in one place because they literally socioeconomically can't afford to live anywhere else, can't receive loans, the housing market is was, was racist and is still racist in my opinion, then what happens is black people themselves can't actually make it out of the areas they are being forced into. Does that make any but sense? about five people down the line? What about, I mean, I believe in, I would believe in reparations if our slave ancestors were still alive and maybe they could get the reparations. But now we have affirmative action, we have diversity quotas, we have all these different things. Um, Our slave ancestors aren't still alive. Our Jim Crow grandparents, my parents, or my grandparents experienced Jim Crow, uh, you know, they didn't get affirmative action or diversity quotas. So for me and you to be getting it as though like we need help, I think is a bit off. Well, here's why. Do you think that wealth can affect people five generations down the line? Absolutely, but I also think... Then in that same regard, poverty can also affect people five people down the line. In the same way that wealth can influence your children and your children and your children's children, poverty can influence your children, your children, and your children's children because it is hard to crawl out of. Totally agree, but um, racism and white supremacy are not the only reason why people are poor. So... It also has a lot to do with choices and generational choices. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So what do you think of the choices that keep black people poor? Um, choices that keep black people poor. I think so father... I, asked, I, have, I have my answer on my side ready like to go. Like choices that black people make that keep them poor. I think it's at an individual level. But, I, but, but furthermore, this idea that all black people are poor, I mean, we, we know is not correct. Well, um, I'm not... So right, I'm black middle class. Class. Yeah. We know that we know there's a, even a rising black middle class that's continuously rising. So, um, I mean, choices that people make are at the individual spectrum. There are certain I mean, trends. You live in Beverly Hills. You have a Gucci bag. I mean, I live in West Hollywood. I walked over here with a Gucci bag. So, I mean, I, I clearly not all black people are poor. But the choices that make black people poor is not, they're not just the choices of black people. For instance, when you tell someone that you can't learn to read, mm-hmm. you cannot learn to read, then how are you going to teach your children how to read? And then you tell your kid, and then you tell those same kids, not only can you not learn to read, but you also can't go to good schools. So now you're going to terrible schools, your parents can't read, you can't read, you have no money. You have no resources. For example, my grandmother's grandfather was a slave. That's mm-hmm. how recent it was. It was not that long ago. 
my grandmother's grandfather was a slave. Slavery was uh, what 156 years ago. That's a that's Betty White and a half. That's not that old. When Betty White was born, there were people alive who were still slaves. That's how recent slavery was. So we're not talking about some. We're not talking about the beginning of slavery. We're talking about 1864 when slavery ended. So when do you? Genuine question, and I'm not trying to like put you in a corner, but I'm like, when do you think that is over with? Like, I know I never hear Jewish people talk about Holocaust or say my grandpa, my grandpa was in the Holocaust. And if they are, it's more, it's not like, oh, I need something because he was in it. Um, I never hear about, I never hear Japanese people talk about internment camps, was, which was, you know, uh, more recent than slavery. I just, I never hear about anybody else's ancestral trauma only yeah. from the black community. Well, there's a couple things going on. One, Jewish people did get reparations after World War II. They, they got reparations. They actually were handed the money and everything. We did not get reparations. Um, so that's one. I'm um, also two- Depending is, where they went, yeah. Depending where they went, yeah. Two, it is also easier for Jewish people to assimilate into other parts of white culture than it is for black people because most of us, not all of us, most of us are going to look black no matter what. Whereas Jewish people can just not acknowledge they're Jewish and have very few repercussions of what it means to be Jewish. Whereas black people, it is on most of us, it is on every essence of our being. Right. Um, I, but I do think in 2020, I, I never think that, um, or for the most part, especially in cities like LA or big cities, um, racism is typically a skin color thing. I just simply don't think it's that. I think it's usually a behavior thing. Why do you do this when you say racism? Because it's such an overused word that I just don't even feel comfortable using it in its proper meaning. I have to put quotes around it. Well, I mean, I'm so, it's so interesting that you are you are not comfortable using the word racism, but you're comfortable saying things like Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization or white supremacy oh, is a made up concept. Totally, everything's racist these days. Everything's racist. Well, not everything, but I mean, if you want to hear one of my uh, things that I think you would probably scoff at, all white people are racist. Yeah, I just can't. Would you like for me to explain to you how all white people are racist? Yeah. So if you live in America and you have been, and it's not just America, I can only speak for America because I've only been, you're, you are just the prettiest thing. This little eyelash flip, I can't. Uh -huh. If you are raised in America and you have implicit bias. For example, if you are a little white woman and a big pack of black thugs are walking at you on the sidewalk and you cross the street, that's racist. Hear me out. Oh, God. Even, hear me oh, out. You have to listen. God. You have to listen, Christian. You have to listen. Killing Even me. Okay, but I'm going to listen. You have to listen. If you cross the street that is racist because you are making an assumption on these people based on their race, whether or not they were going to attack you, doesn't change whether or not the act itself was racist. So if someone is going to, like, for example, if you think to yourself, Jews are greedy and they want money, whether you are right or whether you are wrong, that's still racist. It doesn't matter if they're greedy. I totally, I, I get, I more get the Jewish one. Um, as far as the black one, we, we must, you, you can't just ignore trends and behaviors. When you look at the black part, we're 13% of the population and we're committing, and I know you argue that we're only committing so much crime and only getting prosecuted um, for it because neighborhoods are over-policed, but let's just take the murder rate. Um, black men are committing more murder in the country than any other race, every single other race combined. So- What well, do you think so that's when, probably when because- crosses, When the lady crosses the street, uh, no, let's say I'm the lady, I'm not crossing because you're black or I'm not crossing simply because you're black and it's just your skin color. There's lots behind that and it's behavior, it's not skin color. Like I think it's fair to say that most black people you walk by aren't murderers. And I think it's also- uh, And big black thugs. I think most big black guys are not murderers. I agree. And when I say thugs, I'm referring to how they look. I am what people would categorize as a big black guy. I'm six foot, I'm like for example, I'm six foot two. I am two hundred and thirty pounds. Well, I mean, that's probably what people would, if people saw me on the street, I dress pretty faggy. I mean, if you look at me now, I'm in overalls, 
and I wore you my. You are my, not a fag. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but I think that there are people. For example, I remember walking home. I remember walking home from my job in Berkeley, California, and I was walking behind this woman, and she looked back and saw me, and freaked out so i'm now walking in the same direction as her and she starts moving faster then she looks back and sees that i'm still walking in the same direction as her. she's now fully sprinting she is now in she now gets into the building and she closes the door behind her was and now her and i was it what was it at night it was absolutely at night so then what happened was her and i were um were faced but the weird thing is i saw like people walk behind her i was the only person walking behind her that she ran from and then we were face to face in this glass door that she had closed on me. But then she had a moment where she realized I had a key to the building. So I opened the building I... because I live in the building. <laughs> so I was like, click, click, boom. And then we had a very uncomfortable ride up the elevator. Now, whether or not I would have attacked that woman, what she did was racist. Can so, you agree with that? We, we just have different opinions on what racism is. Who That's does? the thing, though. How we do don't know? get to have opinions about the definition of words. Words have definitions. You that we to don't define know. racism. Well, I'm not going to define. I'm going to actually Google the definition of racism so okay. that we're not using my opinion. Racism okay. definition. And I also don't want you to feel like because I don't want you to feel because a lot of people online when they have debates like this, they feel like you have to have everything at the ready. You're allowed to Google whatever you want. I won't be like, see, you don't even know. Anyway. <laughs> um, prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. No, so we don't even know if she was running from you because you were black. And that's, we such, don't. that's such a, oh gosh, let me plug my computer in real quick. That's such a, a I mean... Maybe because you were a tall man, maybe because you were a man, period. Maybe because it was at night. Maybe you were following too close behind her. Oh, she's a racist. I, I just... Well, I will say this. I will give you this. I don't. I did not interview her on the elevator right up. We just rode in silence, and I did not yeah. ask her why <laughs> she was running from me. But I can say that that's not the only time I've experienced that. And my experience as a black person, as a large, as a six foot two, two hundred and thirty pound black man. I've had a lot more of those experiences than counterparts who are similar size to me, but white. Like, how, I, mean, I mean, and you probably have different, I'm a lot blacker than you are. I also probably look more intimidating if I'm not looking particularly faggy that day. I mean, how tall are you? I'm five nine. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a big person. So okay. I navigate the world with a lot of people who are just, generally speaking, aware that if I wanted to, I could probably aggress them and there'd be little they could do about it because I'm larger than they are. Right. So you and I navigate the world from completely different perspectives. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, here's a question I have for you. Um, is America great? Totally. So what does Make America Great Again mean? Um, Make America Great Again has to do with, um, or for me personally, um, and how I took it. And I mean, there's a hits a couple different points, but the one that I'm going to give is um, ending these neoliberal trade deals that Obama put into place that just wiped middle America out, screwed middle America, and favored um, transnational corporations um, who are acting as though they're fighting a revolution with BLM right now, which is just ridiculous, Fa favored globalists, favored people like that, just trying to wipe out middle America, trying to wipe out the middle class. One, ending that, bringing jobs back to America. Bring, building middle America, building the middle class back up, the foundation of our country, the backbone of it. One. Two, mass immigration, which is my number one most passionate issue. Turning the flow off a little. We take in the most immigrants in the world, more than Russia, more than China. Can we get them mm -hmm. to take a few immigrants? We take in the number one, we take in the highest amount of immigrants. We just need to turn the flow down a little bit. Let's focus on the And why, why is that? Here, huh? Why do you think we need to turn down the flow on immigrants? Because poor mass immigration to the country, especially when it's low wage work, drives our already um, low wage workers' wages down even more. Let's give them a chance to get a raise. What about the immigrants who just got here last year? Let's help them. Let's focus on natural born citizens. Let's just turn it down a little. 
So what about the fact that uh, taxes, like according to Trump's tax plan, the middle class won't get a tax cut? There is this notion that people are paying less taxes in the middle class with Donald Trump is categorically false. It's just not true. In fact, what Donald Trump does do is- I wasn't discussing taxes at all then. I'm talking about the middle class. So what, what, what Trump is doing is actually having the middle class pay more taxes and giving tax breaks to wealthier people, which is similar to Reaganomics, which trickle down economics through Reagan, which um, most economists, like I don't know the exact number, but a overwhelming majority of economists are like, that doesn't work. Giving rich people more money does not actually boost the economy. Well, a black economist, it was actually a black economist. He was just talking about... Um, when certain states specifically, not on the federal level, but states are raising taxes exponentially on the rich, these rich people start moving out of the state. And then instead of providing incentives for those rich people, they take their money and they go to a different state. So now that state's lost all their rich people. This idea that um, the middle class are paying such high taxes and are not getting a tax break, I mean, I... Well, that's also a false claim that uh, rich people are mass exiting these towns. That's that's also a falsehood. There are some rich people. Well, we would have to define what's rich as well. Well, based on the tax cuts, it's anyone making over $450,000. That's where the tax, a household that makes more than $450,000 is where the tax breaks really start. But regardless, regardless, the rich pay, what is it, 30? It's like 70% of taxes. But because they make more money so yeah, therefore they should pay more taxes yeah so they can get a tie i don't think there's a problem with them getting a tax break they're paying the majority of the taxes well in theory they sh i mean it should be scaled and based on what you pay not based not getting tax breaks just because you make more money and the idea of getting tax breaks is the idea that you are now somehow giving that wealth back down to poorer people which statistics have shown actually here's something i want to talk about with you Unless you want to talk more about that, because I want you to no, get no, all no, your... We can jump around. One of the things that really bothers me that Donald Trump does... Uh, this is really upsetting. I actually need to go back to the thing. Um, when one... There we go. Um, one of the things that bothers me that Trump does the most, actually, is claiming that... Which there is truth to what he's saying. During his presidency, the black unemployment rate is at its lowest. But without acknowledging that that's not because of what he did. So if you look at the unemployment rate, which, by the way, black and white unemployment rate, unemployment rates are practically parallel. So everyone gains and loses jobs at the exact same rate, except for the fact that black people are typically more unemployed than white people. And in my opinion, again, that goes back to systemic racism. It's hard to shake. shake it's hard to shake poverty just the way it's hard to shake wealth. Some people can't get un like Jeff Bezos's child won't be able to be unwealthy. He right. won't be able to shake the wealth. And right. when you are that poor, you can't shake the poverty. So black people and white people have been categorically been losing and gaining um, employment for the past hundred years at a parallel rate. So when Donald, when Barack Obama became the president to be at the very beginning of his term, the unemployment rate was at its highest. Over the course of the next eight years, it was getting lower and lower and lower and lower. It was at such a high rate. So. Well, when he, when he, that was because he was inheriting George Bush's presidency. So it was right. going down during Barack Obama's presidency because of things that Barack Obama and Joe Biden were doing to lower it. And then because it was already on the downslide, right. when Donald Trump became the president, Black unemployment was at its lowest because of things that had happened beforehand. Did you and know any economist worth their weight in nickels will tell you that what's going on during your presidency is, is usually is usually because of what happened during the last president. So are we going to acknowledge that the reason why the black unemployment rate is at its lowest is because of what President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden did? Well, I would have an easier time doing that if these numbers didn't ring through my head. And the numbers are in eight years of Obama's presidency, he created, I think, 150,000 jobs for black Americans. In Donald Trump's, it was two million jobs. Obama's eight years, 150,000 jobs. Donald Trump's four years, two million. So I would have really loved to see the statistics on that, um, even in the so first it's debate. Numbers, it's just numbers like that that make me go, 
Yeah, well, and Donald Trump was doing something totally different. But where a, are you getting those those numbers for? That's from that's from. I mean, you can find it on a .gov website. Um, and also, the question: and If you look up Donald Trump's platinum plan, let me look up his platinum plan. And I think the know. other, and I think the other question is: What were the jobs that Donald Trump was creating? Were these actually sustainable, good jobs, or was he just creating think, a bunch of bullshit ass jobs that black people ended up having? But but see, that's the other thing about the black community. It, it seems as though nothing's ever enough. So not so. At first, it's you know we have such a high unemployment rate, we need jobs. Well, then. We get two million jobs, and now oh, they're not sustainable. Okay, you know. Well, I think it will be enough when it's equality. I, I think that outside of equal, I would say personally, outside of equality, you're right. Nothing is enough. It's right. not enough until oh. it is oh, I truly. Think I think we have equality of opportunity, equality of result. I don't think we should be implementing through policy. But again, I just I just showed you that by inheriting poverty, you don't actually have equality of opportunity. If you and I are both in a race to try it, like, let's say you and I are on some TV I show. Start. Well, in honestly, in racing, you kick my ass. I saw those backflips. You're really good. But in if you and I had to build a house and you were like, you can use anything you have at your disposal, plus we will give each of you $1 million. But if you already have $5 million, and I'm starting just with a million dollars, that's not actually equality of opportunity. It's not. You have more than I have. But that's seen so throughout every single race. That's seen, that's seen throughout every single race. It's not just black. Yeah. People. It's not just black versus white. It's white versus white. It's black versus black. I had a bit of a head start than most black people. So what... Life's not. But, I mean, but when you but when you look at all the numbers in general, it seems that statistics support the fact that Black people are, generally speaking, at a higher disadvantage than White people. And we can cherry we can cherry pick Oprah and Barack Obama right. and uh, Jay Z and Alicia Keys and be like, see, look, Black oh, people yeah, are no, thriving. No, no, no. That's just ridiculous. I, I wouldn't do that, but. I mean, like, in what areas are you talking about? Because as when I talk about opportunity, I'm saying you can study and you can go to any university basically for free because of well, that's scholarships. Well, you that's can, also uh, not true. That's not true either. For example, if you think about a black person who's growing up, for example, there are lots of black people who will grow up in a family where they don't have time to do the study, do the research, people who had to get jobs to support their families. So everything that the white person had the opportunity to do, some black people or some Not poor every people white person has that though. Like no, that, that's but, just but statistically speaking, white people have it more than black people, and that is a fact. And that's simply because of skin color and systemic racism, or at this point, could it be because of generational choices? Well, it's not just because of uh, skin color, but it's, it is because of systemic oppression that you, we certainly cannot shake in 156 years or however many years since slavery ended. It is because of generational choices, not just black generational choices, but choices that white people have made to black people. Those choices are directly affecting black people and black people are having a hard time some a lot of times getting out of that mindset because of the mentality put on us by white people. What's that mentality? I think that there is a there's a mentality that um, for example when people are told is nothing's ever good enough for you as if like this is something being given to you we're give, like we we gave you these crumbs we gave you welfare we gave you affirmative action we gave we gave you freedom we gave you uh we gave you black neighborhoods we let you have hbus and that was never good enough so the idea that like black people are like black people have been called lazy ever since they stopped working for free so i guess my question is like so what do you want to do about it because i'm seeing all these i mean we just talked about you just listed a couple things but i you know i, I was saying you can apply to any single college we have affirmative action we have all these opportunities to get ahead that a lot mm -hmm. of white people do not have and that is not enough so what what will be enough what is what what's the golden ticket 
Well, I'm not an economist, nor am I a um, social repair worker. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a comedian. I'm a drag queen. I'm a makeup artist. I'm a, a clown. But what I do notice is that, um, for example, in order to, for Black people to be able to have equal opportunities to white people, there needs to be work done at a systemic level that will repair things that have been done to the Black community. It's not enough to ask black people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps when we either don't have boots or their boots are so fucking raggedy that as soon as you pull them, they fall apart. So you can't just tell people, pull yourself out of the mire. Look, Obama was a president. Beyonce, yeah, well, Beyonce can sing and dance and write music. So yeah, that's, Beyonce- that's successful. And that's why so, a lot of people aren't gonna reach her level of success. She has a talent. Well, she, I, don't wanna be all, I don't wanna all be equal. I don't want well, to. No. I want to all have equality of opportunity, not result. That's what I mean. But we, but, but in order to truly have the equality of opportunity, you're going to have to give black people a boost. Otherwise, they can't actually reach the same thing. If we're both the same height, but you're standing on a footstool, you're going to reach higher than I am because so you like started with an advantage. What area are you talking about? Because Say again? in what areas are you talking about giving black people an extra boost? Well, I would say, for example, um, like Mon black is it just monetarily. Well, that's a big part of it, but also it's not just it's all education. Black schools need to have better teachers. Um, black black uh, areas need to have better infrastructure. The streets need to be better. The roads need to be better. Um, black people need to be um, like, for example, I was hanging out. One, of, I have two boyfriends. That's how left I am. I'm so left. Um, one of my boyfriends is Jewish. The other one is Mexican. One of my boyfriends is Jewish. And I was sitting down with his parents. I remember thinking to myself, like she was talking, his mom was talking about like money and stuff because she's an investor, a venture capitalist. And I was thinking to myself, this woman just knows so much about money. She's actually, that's not even her. She went to college to be a, um, she works in like, she has, she has a doctor, she's like a, she has a pharmaceutical something. She does something with medicine. But she just happens to be a brilliant venture capitalist and she knows so much about money and i was like how do you know she goes well, my parents taught me now my mom has multiple degrees as well but my mom is one of those folks who is the exception not the rule she's the exception to the rule and my but my mom doesn't know a whole lot about money and stuff my mom went to hair school and then she went back to school again to uh for computers um to learn computer science and then different circumstances and now well, that's not the point but because this woman's mom taught her all this stuff she knows and now my boyfriend knows because he's just been taught it his whole life so i think that at an education at a base educational level we need to have good access to very good education from a very young age you know for example like the, the idea that college can't be free in america is inequivocally false and the government can pay for it in america and but I'll the, tell you why. The quality would go so far down. But but here's the thing. Like, for example, in the state of Georgia, in the state of Georgia, anyone who goes to a public school who has a B average or higher goes to college for free. It's called the Hope Scholarship. It's paid for by the Georgia Lottery. So you pay the lottery, and everyone knows that the numbers are on the side of the lottery. Lotteries, they make so much money. So right. they were like, since we have all this money, the government was like, and it's government funded, they are going to use that money to pay for every single person in the state of Georgia who has a B average or higher at a public school. You get to go to a public college for free. It doesn't pay for room and board, but it will pay for your, for your tuition outside of room and board. And therefore, Georgia has one of the highest black college rates of any state in America. So if the nation can implement something like that, which is pretty easy to do, all you have to do is just have a, have a, a lottery sponsored by the state, then therefore, black, the black college rate will go up. So... You think a lot of black people aren't going to school right now simply because of finances? No, I think a lot of black people aren't going to school for because of opportunities. For example, I dropped out of college because when I was in college, I remember I couldn't afford it. Like I was in college and then I had to, I remember, I remember going off to college and when I got there on the first day, I sat down with my guidance counselor, whoever the fuck she was. And I was like, she goes, all right, we have all your classes. That'll be this much money. And I was like, oh, so do I pay that? Like at the end of the, she goes, no, you pay it right now. And I was like, wait, what? She goes, you have to pay it now or you can't go to school. 
And I called my mom and I was like, mom, how am I going to pay for this? And she was like, you have to just pay it because she didn't have the money to give me. Right. So I had to get an emergency loan. And then once I got an emergency loan, I paid that in three installments over the year. It was a lot of money for someone who's 18 who worked at, please don't judge me, everyone watching, working at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I worked at Chick-fil-A. I'm working at Chick-fil-A. So off of a, the wages, someone who worked at Chick-fil-A, then I worked at Ruby Tuesday, I made $2.13 an hour. So on a slow day, I made, I would get checks for $0. It became impossible for me to be able to afford to go to college. I had yeah. to drop out. But furthermore, this idea that one has to go to college in order to be successful in life is simply not true. You're successful without a college degree. And I think, you know, through the years, as college has become more of a um, everybody has to go to college type of thing, the uh, what's the word? The importance, that's not the word I want, but the importance of having a degree has become mm -hmm. less important. It's become less important to have a degree in order to find a job in the job I market. Agree. Everybody goes. So I don't think edu college education is necessarily the proportion is proportional to black poverty mm -hmm. and can help to bring it down. Well, I agree. I mean, I personally think that college is actually the second biggest, the second biggest scam in America. Uh, especially higher education is a huge scam. I mean, only followed by and way behind. Uh, religion. Um, I, I actually, I know you're a Christian, even with, I mean, I think that Christianity is actually probably one of the biggest things holding back the black community. I think that Christianity is a religion that was forced on us by white people. Um, I think that if, because whenever I remember growing up and I grew up Christian, I didn't grow up like this. I grew up as a Christian and I remember here, everything's like according to God's plan, according to God's plan. And I remember thinking to myself, if all of this stuff is God's plan, this plan is racist this plan is homophobic. This plan is transphobic. This plan favors rich white people because if everything is according to God's plan, why is everything happening at a disproportionate negative rate to black people? If it's according to the plan, the plan is racist. But you and I can talk religion another time. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, well, I'm happy to kind of offer something if you want. But Sure. Um, because what I would say is, I mean, biblically – it talks about that we have free will down here. We have free will on the earth. So it's not, we're not puppets. God doesn't have us like, like, like a puppet and a puppet master. So no, life's not going to be fair. No, there's definitely going to be bad things. But it's also according, but also God designed this. So God designed a structure where a, where a lot of, not just a few, but a lot of kids can be born in Africa with AIDS and then starve to death for five years based on the design. That's not free will. Oh, no, 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 but, but Christians don't believe that that was the design. The design was perfect harmony and then sin comes in, but that's a whole Bible conversation. The, I mean, all, I mean, perfect design. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, how perfect was the design? If it, how perfect was the design? If it was that flawed, that it ended up being to the point where kids are just dying of disease at well, a complete disproportionate level. Or we were puppets, and he didn't choose to make us as puppets. So, how much of the free, how much free will does a kid have born in poverty and with AIDS and dies of starvation? How much free will is that? Like, can that kid will themselves out of that situation? Oh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when God created the earth, He didn't create us as robots. He created us with free will. And when and when biblically Adam and Eve chose to sin, well then. Sin came into the world and all the bad things came into the world. That's what the Bible preaches. Well, also, as a total side note, Christianity is also a blatant plagiarism of, um, like, Egyptian religions that came before. Like, it's just a complete, complete plagiarism. But that's not the point. I mean, my religious things are, are pretty deep. I, I want to ask you another quick question. I also want you to ask me questions, too, because we're going to wrap up pretty soon. I want to give it about an hour. So when specifically, when they say make America great again— what time frame are we talking about? When, when was America great, and and who was it great for? Um, I think we're I think we're talking Reagan years. I think we're talking Reagan years, and I think mainly we're talking economy. So we we think that that um we think that or America was great. America was great during like the eras of Reaganomics. Yeah. And pre-Obama, pre those neoliberal trade deals, pre the mass immigration, pre all that stuff. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, if we're gonna look at, um, if we're gonna look at 
categorically speaking, how history has has uh, what economists up. believe affects the economy. If if America was great economically speaking during Reagan's presidency, it is because of what Jimmy Carter did before him. This is basically every economist agrees that what you you can't turn the economy like that. There is just no, with the exception of coronavirus shutting down the nation overnight, you cannot turn the economy in two years. It's not possible. So if America was great during Reagan's years, it's because of Jimmy Carter before him, not because of Ronald Reagan. And then after Ronald Reagan, people are like, well, started whenever, going- we talk, whenever we talk about what certain presidents did in their, in their time as president, we don't go, oh, but shift it back one. But you, but you, but you do, but you, but if you want to talk about the effects, you like we won't find out how Donald Trump. Actually, we're gonna have a really hard time of finding out how Donald Trump affected our economy because of COVID nineteen. But we would have found out in about five to six years because that's how economics works. That's the theory of trickle down economics. And if, you, and if you look at trickle down economics and how it started to negatively impact George W. Bush's George H. W. Bush's presidency, and then really spilling into Bill Clinton's presidency, and then during Bill Clinton's presidency, it started to recover again toward the end. And at the beginning of George Bush, George W. Bush Jr.'s uh, 43's presidency, and then of course it was bad again right at the beginning of, Obama, of Obama's presidency. So you actually, you, you actually do have to shift it back. You can't just ignore facts. So if we're if we're saying again, Americans- again, we have to go back to numbers. We have to go back to job creation, opportunity zones, and now I'm talking black community. But like Donald Trump, job creation, opportunity zones. Funding HBCUs. These are things that Donald Trump did, not Obama. So these are things the black, specifically, I'm talking more black economy now. These are things specifically the black community is receiving that Donald Trump did, not Obama. So now HBCUs are being funded, um, are being funded. That's not because of Obama. And I would think that that would have an economical effect eventually with black communities, right? Well, I reckon I reckon we'll find out in about five or six years. Yeah. Um, so, so a lot of you know Trump's economy has to, I believe, has to do with things he set in place during his presidency. Not but also, a- Donald Trump. I mean, I'm I'm not someone who believes that Donald Trump has every word he's uttered is wrong. I mean, Christian, even a broken clock is right two times a day. Yeah. No one is wrong all the time. You totally. see what I'm saying? Um. So one of my fears with the Republican Party is that this cult of personality that is surrounding Donald Trump, they won't allow Donald Trump to be wrong about anything. Whereas the the Democratic Party, in my experience, is much more interested in holding people accountable. If Joe Biden does something wrong, they're like, oh, that was wrong. We're, we're, we're going to vote for you, but they're not the – Repu- the Democratic Party is not saying – Joe Biden doesn't have a doesn't have a problem with racism. We're saying Joe Biden introduced an anti crime bill that may have lowered um, crime rates, but it incarcerated a lot of black people, and we have a problem with that. Joe Biden has also addressed that, said that it was a mistake, and that he wants to fix it. Whereas when Donald Trump does stuff, even if he says something that is blatantly a lie, everyone just kind of gets on board with a lie and acts like it's not a lie. Well, Donald Trump came and did the first step act, so instead of talking about Instead of talking about doing something for Joe, Joe's crime bill as Joe does, he actually did something or is actually working to do something, one. And number two, I would say a lot of that um, defense of Trump comes from that we do a lot of times feel like we're on the defense for Trump. It does seem like in the media, everything Donald Trump does is wrong. You won't hear about, you won't hear them talk about the economy. You won't hear them talk about his platinum plan he's doing for because, black Because he's not... Because we don't know yet if he's fixed the economy because it's but too know, soon. But we know where we are as a country pre-COVID, of course. We know we know how the economy is functioning pre-COVID. But so, again, that was because of Barack Obama. Every economy was And I disagree. We know, we know HBCUs are being funded. We know First Step Act was created. A lot of black Americans don't even know about so this. My question is, do you disagree? So you, it's, that's another thing. Like, like when, when officials that are like, well, rep- like have great reputation and say something, and Donald Trump just goes, I disagree. Like, you can disagree with economists, but that doesn't make w- what they're saying false. For example, when when Donald Trump says something about um, the COVID, his reaction to COVID, and every single medical professional that we trust says, that's not right. 
And everyone's like, I agree, Donald Trump's right. But he's he's not a scientist. He's not a doctor. He's a dude who built who who has built some buildings in New York City. So right. why would you listen to Donald Trump before you listen to Dr. Fauci? Because those Fauci's been wrong. That's why. So when, when they're wrong and they're wrong and the CDC's wrong and the uh, WHO is wrong and, and Fauci's wrong about, and he's changing from gloves to masks to this to do that, you, it doesn't seem like do your you, scientific background is really helping you out. So do you think that Dr. Fauci was probably wrong because it was a brand new disease that the world had never heard of and he was reporting about it on a day-to-day -day basis? So he was reporting his scientific findings. And then that's what I love about scientists. Scientists will always say, oh, I was wrong. They'll be like, actually, that was not correct. We did more research and actually was wrong. So what doctor, it's, it is a, it is, when I say brand new, this disease yeah. is newer, it's newer than the PS5. It is brand fucking new. So it's not like Dr. Fauci out here just spouting out. Dr. Fauci is unequivocally the nation's number one expert on infectious diseases. So if he's wrong, everyone below him was wrong too. So, and you know who's been wrong more times? Uh, President Donald Trump. So why? So why would you? Why won't you allow Dr. Fauci to be wrong, but you will allow Donald Trump to be wrong a myriad of times? Oh, oh, I, I would say I allow for both to be wrong. But then the next thing I would say about Dr. Fauci specifically is there's a lot of practicing doctors who are experiencing COVID with their patients that they're treating that disagree with Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci's not out practicing; he's studying. So. So that's where it gets murky. Just because Dr. Fauci is one of the best at his studies. Um, Not one of the best. He's the, the nation's leading expert. Okay. Well, there's a lot of practicing doctors who are with, who are treating the disease every single day who are saying, whoa, 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 no, you're wrong about this. And they get shut out. I don't know if you watched those frontline doctors. Remember when the frontline doctors were at, um, were in DC and they were talking about their experiences with COVID. Why are they just completely shut out? Why are their YouTube videos taken down? Why can't we at least listen to what they have to say? So, so that's where it gets murky. It seems as though, oh, Dr. Fauci's the number one best at his study, so you will listen to him, and he's always right, period. Well, a lot of doctors are disagreeing with him. Well, I mean, I think mean, that happens with doctors and scientists over yeah. course of things. That's why they say nine out of 10 dentists recommend, not 10 yeah. out of 10 dentists, because there's, you know, a dentist who's like, actually, but simple things like, for example, wear a mask. Practically, every single doctor is like, you gotta wear a mask. Every scientist is like, you really, if you want to slow the spread of this disease, you're going to have to put on a mask. And then when Donald Trump lies about things like, for example, he'll just say out loud, if Joe Biden had been president, two million people would be dead. When he's actually bending a truth, what he's not saying out loud is, the, 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 the professional said, if America had literally done nothing, about two million people would be dead. But that's not what Donald Trump says. He's making it seem like he saved 180 million lives when he didn't. He's insinuating that I, that the national death toll would be twice the global death toll if Joe Biden was president, and that is categorically false, and it's a lie. Do you agree oh. with that? Oh, no, no, no. Simply because President Trump was trying to block um, travel super early, and Joe Biden was calling it xenophobic. So Joe Biden would have been allowing travel for much longer than Donald Trump did. Unless Joe Biden's a hypocrite. And, and the question is, do, but also, that. yeah, but, but also a lot of it's professionals saying that, that banning travel isn't actually the thing to really block coronavirus because we could, we would not have been able to actually keep Corona out of the country. Yeah. Literally. So what what's actually causing the perpetuating the spread of coronavirus isn't people coming in with coronavirus. It's once it's here, the practices that people have who have coronavirus or people who don't have coronavirus, that's what's actually perpetuating the spread of corona, not traveling in with it. It's what happens once it's here. So there's no reason why we should have- But it's not the, as though travel doesn't have an effect. It's, it's not, that, that, it doesn't, it's not yeah. that it doesn't have an effect, but it is impossible. To, it would have been, regardless, impossible to stop coronavirus from entering America. It's entered totally. practically- over with 250 whatever countries, every country in the world it has gone into. So there, there, there was there was no stopping Corona from getting. But it away. would have been a lot worse had Joe Biden just left the borders open um, because he was scared of being called a, xen a xenophobe. Not necessarily true because also it's about what you do once the virus is here. So for example, the fact that coronavirus started in China, it was like started in China, and we have more deaths than them. That's absolutely 
about what's going on. Now, I will say this. China was engaging in extreme human rights violations in an attempt to stop coronavirus. They were welding people into their homes. They were beating people. Like, they were engaging in some extreme human viol- human rights violations. And because their tactics were so extreme, the rates in China are so low. But it wasn't about corona coming into China. It was about what they did once they had corona in their system. And right. the answer they they took really extreme measures in terms of stopping people from spreading it to one another, not stopping outsiders from bringing corona into their country. They did stop outsiders, though. They completely shut the borders. They completely it, stopped travel. They yeah, completely yeah. stopped travel between cities. Yeah. Um, and, and for, oh gosh, what was I going to say? But that's what I'm saying, too. It's not about blocking off the borders. It's it's about, I mean, like, in America, we have done things like restricting travel from city to cities, making sure that people look after you. If you're coming from a city with a large infection rate, you have to register, and they'll trace you and all that kind of stuff. America's a lot more lax on hum- on the human rights violations than um, than China is. Um, but that's all I'm saying is it's not it's not this idea that two million people would have been dead. You still think that's true? Like you you you're gonna support well, that? Well, 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 I well I pretty much think Joe Biden called Donald Trump a xenophobe just for political points. So based on Biden's language and rhetoric, he would have shut the borders down much later. And I and I I don't know what he would have done. Um. So. I don't know if the number would have been two million. I COVID isn't really my specialty of expertise, but I do think um, I do think Donald Trump's done as much as he can. And I also see it's further exemplified with Donald Trump's done really great things for or done as much as he could for COVID because Republican states are faring much better than Democrat states. We have well, people not- Cuomo who were we have people like Cuomo who were sticking COVID patients into nursing homes. We have people um, California. We were on a massive shutdown, massive lockdowns. Yet we have all these high numbers. So, dude, and the I would a- like to talk to you about why what you're saying is actually a little bit misleading. So the reason why Repu- like red states are faring a little bit better than blue states is because – Compared to New York. And- yeah. It's because – I think you're comparing it to deaths and early COVID rates. So when COVID entered New York City, it was February. It was February. So we had practically no protocol. So now by the time that COVID makes its way to Texas or – Georgia or North Dakota, there's already protocols. We now have ventilators. When I first got back to New York City, we didn't even have masks. I had to make my mask with my own sewing machine. So that is why there was such a spread. And now that the states are doing that stuff, the spikes are actually in the red states. But because we have protocols, we have procedures, we have treatments, the death rates are lower. Well, yeah, but the, that's my whole but thing. But the fact, the the fact that the fact that South Dakota has a similar infection rate to New York City is in to New York State is insane, considering how few people live in South Dakota, but and the fact that the rates are even close to similar is uh, it speaks volumes on the social distance practices of people in South Dakota. One thing I, I don't really care if anybody gets it; I care about death. So you know, there's a lot of people who have it in their system and don't don't experience any symptoms. One, two. I also find that we're we have so much. Uh, we have so many positives in the country because we are doing so much testing. My friend just moved back from LA to Canada, and he texted me and my other friend in a group message and said, "You know what Trump said, and he's not even a huge Trumper. What Trump said was actually right. You have so many um, positives there because you're doing more testing than we are here. I can't even get a test anywhere. So don't really care about who's testing positives. Of course, care about deaths." Well, a big reason why caring about who tests positive is important is because just because you aren't dying from coronavirus yourself doesn't mean that your infection on someone else will cause them to die. So the spreading of the disease, whether you die from it or not, getting the disease can result in can result in someone's death. Right. So so that's why I care about infections because people. I mean, I think they they said fifteen people died, fifteen thousand people died between the debates. Right. But as long as the death rate's going down, I'm not sure. I mean, well, the death rate, again, the death rate's going down because we now have more treatments than before. There were no treatments before. There were no treatments, yeah. So that's so now red states are having lower death. But if the red states have probably been getting affected back when the nation had literally no treatments, there'd probably be more deaths. 
But it also seems like the goalpost for this um, keeps moving back. It, we started with two weeks to slow the spread. And my friend and everybody was telling me who's on the left is, no, everybody's still going to get it. We're just going to slow the spread and make sure hospitals aren't don't get overwhelmed. Well, mm -hmm. hospitals weren't getting overwhelmed. Sure, there were some, but um, clearly not that many or the media wouldn't have been using hospitals from Italy um, in their media coverage and tried to try to make hospitals look like they were overwhelmed. So first it was two weeks to slow the spread. Everybody's still going to get it. We just don't want to overwhelm the hospitals. Then it was, uh, we just don't want people to get it. Then it was, oh, deaths are going up or deaths are going down. Cases are going up. Now it's the vaccine. When, when does it end? When, I mean, well, there's people if, getting if you, flus down as well. Flu mm -hmm. happens to be down, which I find to be shady. It's just so like- if you, if you if you want to um, look at uh, some like I did an interview on my page um, where one of my friends who was a nurse in um, at one of the biggest hospitals in New York City and he said that um, he was like I don't know he like this idea that hospitals weren't overwhelmed that's that's categorically false at his hospital he said he had he had literally in his prior ten years his prior ten years as a nurse. In two months, he'd seen more deaths than he had ever seen in his entire 10 years. So I would say that is, and, and morgues were literally, in. there was a point in New York City where they literally were putting bodies in the park. They were putting bodies in the freezer. They were putting bodies in trucks. So I think the idea that hospitals aren't overwhelmed is, again, categorically false. Well, possibly in New York City, but around the country, there was hospital after hospital after hospital with empty parking lots, nurses getting laid off, more nurses than ever. One of the few times in history that more nurses than ever were getting laid off at such high rates. So, so well, that's probably because in the middle of the country there weren't a lot of COVID infections, but as COVID started to spread across the nation, well, if and, that then, was the case, by the time it reached, short, just do the two weeks. Say again? Why were we in Texas and LA? LA did get that. Why were we in Texas on lockdown for two weeks so hospitals didn't get overwhelmed? They weren't overwhelmed. Well, it was probably in an attempt to stop the spread of coronavirus. They're probably trying to keep it in New York City. Again, I'm I'm not an expert. Right, me either. But but what I'm but I'm sure what people would have really been upset about is some sort of a locking down of the cities themselves. You you know you can't tell people you can't leave your city, especially when your city. And I was in New York when when it first happened because I just finished filming um, my show. Um, it was genuinely terrifying genuinely one of the scariest things I've ever been a part of because everyone was freaking out because we didn't, we couldn't look left. We couldn't, we didn't know if you could talk to people, if you could see anyone, we, we didn't know, we did not know anything. Um, so anyway, I, do you have, do you have any questions? Do you have any question that you always wanted to ask a leftist uh -huh. and wanted a genuine answer? Cause I would love to answer that question for you. Um, do you hate capitalism? No, I don't hate capitalism, but I can see where capitalism engages in a practice that could be detrimental to some people in society. But I also engage in capitalism myself. I have a job. I have TV shows. I sell merchandise. I buy from Amazon. But um, it would be um, a it would be trite of me to pretend like I don't see how buying from Amazon could be detrimental to the um, to the planet or to the the nation at least. Um, and then final question. Oh, what do you think about immigration? Are you for open borders? Are you for more immigration? Are you for a little control? You know, back in the late 80s and early 90s, even actually, I think George Bush, too, was really into this notion of uh, naturalizing the people who made it into the country. This idea where if you take people who are in this country... This is actually really it was this was actually huge in the Republican Party up until oh, Donald I Trump. Know. Oh, you're, you're killing Where me. you take people who because they are here, they're engaging in everything that we're engaging in. The only difference is they're just not paying taxes. So if you make all those people who are here illegally, if you make them legal and they start paying taxes, you will get a boost to the economy. Now, in in Donald Trump's attempts to uh seal off the border in Mexico, Crime rates have not gone down. So, like all he, all we, all we did was pay for this mess. For me, it's not just about crime or dr doing drug. None of that stuff has gone down. So, all we've done is just paid for this really expensive wall that we were promised we wouldn't have to pay for. We were promised time and time again. So we we paid tax on remittances to Mexico, and the wall would pay for itself in ten years. Yeah, he he could, but he hasn't. Right.
So, I mean, that's like saying he could just ask some random Mexican guy to pay for it, and then they got to pay for it. But, but that 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 didn't happen. So yeah, he could, but for whatever reason, he just hasn't done it. Um, so my mindset uh, um, is, I think that it makes more sense to make it to easier, not. make it easier to navigate being an American citizen. Got it. I mean, where's your family from? Uh, my dad's family is from Georgia. My mom's from New York. Are you are you a descendant of slaves of American slaves? Yeah. Or, okay, because because you never know. Some folks are like, oh, actually, my parents uh, are yeah, African immigrants, or yeah. And you received a lot of shit for calling your dad dark black. How do you feel about that? Oh, gosh, and I only said it because half the time people are telling me you're not even actually black. You're light skinned You don't you don't even know what racism is like. So I just wanted to make it clear he's dark black, which he is. Do you consider yourself black? Yeah, for sure. Work. Um, Christian, I honestly think that if I keep talking to you, you're going to become a leftist. Oh, no, Bob. Nope, never. you're going to do I'm telling you. I'm telling you right now. If I keep talking to you, you're going to be voting for Trump next week. Under no circumstances. I can <laughs> see. I can see the chinks in your armor being knocked away. And you're like, oh, my God. I think that Bob the drag. Who would have ever thought that this drag queen would be the one? To, to make me a you. leftist. Oh, wow. Well, the day I, think, I think there needs to be more, in my opinion, reaching across the aisle. Yeah, this was very nice. I mean, people on Twitter definitely don't do this. I mean, I mean, the fact for you to invite me on your show when you could have just attacked me on Twitter and just been nasty, I mean, is very valiant. I, I might still that. do it. I might still do it. We'll go to Earth Bar after and get a smoothie. <laughs> Well, listen. I'm in LA. We'll, we'll maybe we'll do this in What's person. Smoothie. You're gonna. You, you better watch out. If you you know if you hang around in the barbershop long enough, you're, long enough, you're gonna get a haircut. You heard that expression? You keep hanging around with you with with Trump leftists. You're gonna be on the Trump admin. You're gonna end up becoming a, a atheist, witch, non-binary. Oh, so um, you're gonna be a, a Jesus saved Trumper. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you all for listening, and we'll see y'all next time.